Well, hello there, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of web presentations for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. Today, we're going to talk about managing the spring green up. This being the first week in April 2020, some of us have already turned livestock out on pasture. Some of us are holding in for a little while, but we'll be turning out here real soon. Um, we covered this in the first web presentation. But we had some questions and some comments and thought maybe we ought to cover it a little more in depth. Uh, while I've mentioned that we had some questions and comments, I'd like to thank you all for your kind words of encouragement and questions and comments about our web presentations. We appreciate hearing from all of you and appreciate having the feedback. This is kind of a new way to do web presentations for us, at least. And uh, it's nice to have the feedback. I'm used to doing live face-to-face -face presentations and then be able to see the crowd and hear questions. So getting them one way or another is great for us. Also, while I'm here and thanking folks, I wanna thank uh, my fearless leader here, the district conservationist, Beth Kruksack. Um, she's the woman behind the camera. I call her Mrs. Boss. She takes care of taking these web presentations that I've recorded, getting them on Facebook, getting them on YouTube and getting them out to all of you folks. So. Thanks, Beth. And with that, we'll go on to managing the spring green up. All right, this slide was from the first web presentation I did. And I thought I'd go ahead and go back over it just in case anybody missed the first presentation. You don't have to go back and listen to that one again. Uh, spring's a good time to take soil tests if we need them. Uh, if you're already taking soil tests and taking them in the fall, by all means, keep taking them in the fall. But for me, soil tests work best in the spring because that's when I have the time to take soil tests in the spring. And if you're not taking soil tests, uh, now's the time. I say that with soil tests and with Lyme applications. When someone calls and asks, when do I do either? I say, now, today. Today's the day. So uh, <clears throat> if we're, we haven't turned animals out on pasture yet, uh, we do want to wait until that grass is somewhere around four inches or forage is somewhere around four inches. And is there weather that looks like the grass is going to continue to grow or the forage is going to continue to grow? That's the hard part here in April is seeing that the grass is growing, but knowing that there may be a cold snap on the horizon. We've got a little bit of a cold snap coming up here soon. I don't think it's going to be enough to slow things down, but it's something that's kind of concerned me and I've held the, the cows in so far just because I want to make sure that we can got enough grass to graze through that cold snap. And then after that, we want to take half and leave half um, all the way through the grazing season. In fact, I, I'd really rather take less than half and leave more than half. One of the challenges I've laid down is to leave more residue with every passing or every grazing, leave more residue. Also, I use spring to inventory our grazing equipment. What do we have? What do we need? How many more reels of poly wire do I need? Do I need new step in posts? Do I need new fence chargers? Uh, all the other things that go in with grazing. This spring, we're putting out some above ground water lines that we haven't used in several years, but we're going to go ahead and get them hooked up and get them going just to make our grazing season go a little better. Uh, this is also the time to think about reseeding those winter sacrifice or torn up areas. Uh, don't be afraid to use this time to diversify your pastures to get some different forages out there and growing. I know there's some talk about maybe we ought to plant them to summer annuals. Maybe we ought to, maybe we can plant them now. You know, that's a decision that each of you have to make what we're going to plant them to. My version of that is I, I go ahead and spread some seed on them this time of year. In fact, I did it two weeks ago. Uh, see what grows. If it comes up in mostly weeds, then I'll go out kind of clean that area up maybe with a blade or something and then replant some summer annual later on in the summer and then I know it is spring but it's it's always time to prepare for the extending grazing season um, we don't want to graze things too hard we want to make sure that there's good residue we always want to keep in mind that the growing season and the grazing season don't have to be the same time we can graze forages way after the growing season has ended or before it's even started if we planted some cool season annuals maybe in the fall of last year we may be grazing them right now 
Being we're talking about uh, spring management, managing the spring green up, I thought it was important to throw in some tips for beginning grazers. Uh, as we put these presentations on the web, they, they kind of grow legs and, and they're around for a while. And there may be some folks watching these that are beginning grazers or new to management intensive grazing in general. Spring's a hard time to manage. Uh, we've got things growing really fast. We're grazing things shorter than we would like. Um, we can, there's lots of rules that we follow with grazing that kind of we break right first off in the spring. In fact, there are other places in the world that they don't even worry about splitting the pasture up and different paddocks and things in the spring. They let everything kind of go as continuous grazing until the spring flush really hits and everything's really growing fast. And then they kind of paddock the, the pasture off and and start rotationally grazing. I don't really like that plan. I think it's still good to keep some sort of rotation, but <clears throat> this is a tough time to manage because we're starting out almost no growth and then it, it, it really takes off at some point and all of a sudden the pastures are just all trying to go to seed head. So I guess if I'm a beginning grazer, if I'm talking to a beginning grazer, Right now, you want to turn cows out when it's four inches, take half, leave half. You don't want that field to look like it's been scalped when you're done, when the cows are done and moved on. Uh, don't be uh, surprised if you turn cows out and, and the next day or whenever you're decided you're going to move them, it uh, doesn't look like the cows have even been there. Uh, that's just kind of the way things are in the spring. We want to make sure that it looks sort of like that, like they've not hardly been there and they've moved on to the next field. So if you're a beginning grazer and you've got any questions, by all means, call in to, to your local NRCS, water office, extension office. They can give you some tips on beginning grazing this time of year. Uh, we want to try to uh, allow the animals this time of year to graze the, the grass plants, I guess, that are out there in our sward and, and not really get into those low growing clovers. I noticed a couple days ago in the fields that we were grazing already, um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the steers to graze the grass, leave the clovers alone. It, it, this time of year, if, if we can graze that grass and let the clovers kind of get their feet under them for the spring, uh, they'll grow up and, and then compete with the grass, where if, if we let the grasses kind of overtake things and overshadow things, I think the clovers have a tough time taking off through the summer. So that's always the strategy. That's a hard thing to manage. It's a hard thing to do, but it's, it's a good goal, I guess, for us going forward here in the spring. We need to be moving those animals early and often if possible provide them with a with a bigger area of the pasture if we're in sort of a set stock paddock kind of system uh, at home we move cows every day uh, when we get into summer we move them every 12 hours we move sheep every day we move the steers every day but i know there are grazing systems out there because i've designed a lot of them that are seven paddock or eight paddock systems and they're set up on the basis that we can rotate the animals once a week well, this time of year, though, in the spring, we're, we're not going to be using those as once a week paddocks. We may be grazing those once a day and moving them on and coming back in seven days to, to get them again. We may only be grazing them two days. It's one of the real reasons why I, I would prefer to build a system that uses temporary fence and we build different paddock sizes for the different seasons. Because if we build a paddock system that's seven paddocks or six paddocks, figuring on a weekly rotation, year they don't really work out to weekly rotation they, they need to be two day three day rotations uh, so just so we're all aware we can't turn them into a field that we think will last a week in the summer and it will last a week this time of year this time of year we'll probably make one or two rotations at this kind of low growing four inch five inch six inch height um, it's hard to see and it's hard to visualize but i like to go out right when the cows go out at four inches the next rotation we hope that the forage will be five to six inches the rotation following that we hope that the forage will be six to eight inches those rotations may take us 10 days 15 days 20 days this time of year and then once we get into summer we'll be slowing those rotations down it may take us 30 days 40 days if it, if it gets really dry we may take 60 days to make that rotation around our farm or around our grazing system with me, with the mob grazing, there are fields that I only graze 
twice a year. I graze them once this time of year, graze them once late in the summer, and that's it. That's all they get grazed. <clears throat> After that, one other thing for this spring is to be aware of the wet areas that we have out there in the fields. Uh, we don't want to concentrate cows in those wet areas. This is in eastern Ohio. We've got lots of springs and seeps and what we call wet weather springs. This is the time of year when we need to avoid them. Make sure the mineral feeder don't get, doesn't get put in them. If we're feeding some dry hay out on the field, we need to make sure that we don't get those in those wet areas. Those things can cause us some real problems this time of year, can create some, some more torn up areas that we'll have to deal with later. Wanted to take just a minute to talk about dry matter intake here in the spring. Uh, spring's a time when we're taking animals typically off of dry hay and putting them out on wet, washy spring forages. That animal, we talk about this all the time, is going to eat 3% or less of their body weight. And in the wintertime when they're eating hay, they're eating 30, 40 pound, whatever, for a, a mature cow of forage. Now we turn them out on spring grass and they've got to eat 100 pound or more of wet, washy spring grass. Their stomach's got to get used to taking in that much extra volume and weight. Uh, their rumen's got to be getting adjusted to taking in all that washy, wet grass. There's some things with the protein and energy levels of the spring forage, but mostly it's that they're, they just got to eat so much more. And they've got to harvest it all with a three inch cutter bar across the field that, that only has four inches of forage out there to graze. So we need to be concerned about the body condition of the cows coming off of hay and what they're, they're looking like here the next two weeks. We can really see cows lose body condition these first two weeks when we thought they should be gaining body condition, that they're eating better forage. Um, I've seen it at my place. It's something that I'm very vigilant about. Uh, I don't, I'm not one of those guys that thinks that cows should gain weight through the winter. I think that I put fat on their back all summer long with good grazing management. I don't care if they lose a condition score over the winter because it, it's a tough time. It's, it, that's the way nature intended things to be, at least for me. If you're one of those guys that likes to keep cows in the same body condition year round, that's fine. But I don't want, I don't, I don't mind cows losing a body condition score in the winter. I don't want them to lose body condition going into spring. This is our time. This is the time that we manage forages to, to be growing the, those body conditions, not losing them. So it's something that we need to be watching for. I think we need to consider still feeding some dry hay if we've still got some left. We can go out and unroll some hay on these fresh spring pastures. Um, if we don't have any hay, we need to think about maybe going out there and mowing a portion of the paddock, a third, a half of the paddock the day before. Let it wilt, let it dry up, give those cows something dry to put in their stomach to help them manage this spring washy forage time. This is another thing that makes spring such an interesting time to manage. Uh, we, we may have enough dry matter still left out there. I've seen cows eat leaves this time of year. I've seen cows go around and pick those dry, dead fescue leaves out to be able to put with this wet, washy forage. It's a tough time to manage, and, and this just adds one more thing to, to our spring management and managing the spring green up. As we kind of manage the spring flush here, spring forage, it's important to be thinking about our salt and mineral mix and what we provide out there. This comment kind of comes from our fearless leader, Kendall Bick. Uh, he's the president of our Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, and he called me with some comments and said he'd been at the feed store and was talking to a beginning grazer and then again to a, a kind of an experienced grazer. And both had concerns about the mineral that they're providing out there for the livestock. Spring's a good time to be thinking about a loose salt and mineral mix, uh, something that the cows are going to be able to get enough of. I mean, I know we, we all see those salt blocks at the farm stores for sale, and uh, <clears throat> some of us use them. But to quote Joe Salatin, a cow would have to have a tongue six foot in diameter to be able to get enough salt from one of those salt blocks, especially this time of year, to keep them ticking. Uh, I think the salt mineral mix, a lot of them say one to two ounces of consumption a day, and a cow would, would have to work pretty hard. It'd be darn difficult for them to get one to two ounces of salt from a salt block. 
Also, in the spring, it's a good time to consider buying some high mag mineral, uh, especially if we're in, in an area where we've had trouble with grass tetany before, or uh, if we want to make sure that we, we don't have trouble with grass tetany. Uh, our, our grasses just aren't able to take up enough magnesium this time of year, our forages uh, from the soil. Even if we have a high level of magnesium in the soil, they're not able to take up enough magnesium to keep the cow going. So we need to provide that extra magnesium in the salt and mineral mix for them to be able to have. Uh, I know there are other salt and mineral options out there other than the bagged salt and mineral that we, we can buy. Uh, I hear folks using kelp and Redmond salt. I personally use that uh, sometimes out of the year. I like it. Uh, some other times I just use plain uh, salt and mineral mix that I can buy from our, our local stores. So uh, just pick a, a mineral that works best in your program and is the best for your pocketbook. There are really expensive mineral out there. There's some really, really cheap mineral out there uh, that aren't much more than just salt with some iron added to make it red. So uh, pick a mineral that's going to work best for you and, uh, and for your livestock. I personally go with the middle of the road kind of mineral and uh, we don't feed the higher price stuff because one, I, I don't know that it's worth it Two, it, it, it has some technology in a lot of times that I don't think I really need is in the form of anti-caking agents and other things, but I also don't feed the really cheap mineral. I want to make sure that my cows are getting enough salt and mineral out there, uh, especially this time of year to keep them going. Uh, I put the salt and mineral mix in a separate tub. I move it the same time that I move the water, but I make sure that I put the tub on the opposite side of the field, wherever that may be. If the water is close to the gate, they're going to be moving through next. Then I put the salt on the other side and vice versa to make sure that the cows are trekking the whole field to get to salt and mineral and to water and make sure they take in that salt and, and actually get it instead of leaving some of it in the water when they're going to get a drink. Um, also, this helps to just make sure the cows are covering the whole field, both with their grazing and with the manure that they leave behind. They're trampling some forage, leaving it for the soil health. As I'm winding down this web presentation, I wanted to give a thought to what is next. As we started doing these web presentations, because we've had to cancel so much, so much of our face-to-face -face, um, grazing meetings here this spring, um, we, we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, we were just doing the best that we know how today, to quote Ken Clark. Um, we, we put together a web presentation, the best that we know how, and uh, we had some good responses. So we hope to do this once a week. And uh, we had to cancel the, the April pasture walk. So we're hoping to do a virtual pasture walk when it comes that time, that day. And... Uh, these are just some of the topics that, that I've got kind of kicking around in my mind that I'd, I'd sort of like to cover as the weeks go on. My plan, my goal is to do one of these web presentations every week until we meet again, until we see each other face to face again the next time, whenever that may be. Um, I do want to say that we have extended the invitation to all the rest of our colleagues here with Soil and Water and NRCS and and even some of the council members uh, to help provide content for some of these web presentations. So y'all don't have to always listen to me. And uh, if, if any of them are willing, we'll, we'll be glad to take their content. We'll be glad to take a whole web presentation that they put together and, and produce it into video and put it out there for all of you. So uh, be looking for us to hopefully drop a new video once a week until we meet again. Well, that's a wrap for the third in our series of web presentations for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. As always, we end each Eastern Ohio Grazing Council meeting by thanking our sponsors. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, be looking for our next web presentation to drop next Thursday. And also be looking for our virtual pasture walk that we're going to try to put on. We'll put that on on the date of the typical pasture walk, that being the fourth Thursday of April. Uh, we're still putting together topics of what we're going to cover, but uh, we're 
really excited for going ahead and, and doing that and getting out in the field and looking at some things. So again, thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time.